15 arbitrators who have a very particular mindset, overseen by private organizations. Like Susan Frank said, you have no rights at all in this world. So, why? Why would our government sign up? Well, the, the story, the, the number one thing was trotted out 10 years ago was bilateral, and you'll still hear the Tories say it now, it was in the papers not so long ago. They'll say, ah, oh, look. Foreign investors are never going to come and invest in your country if they don't think that there are protections for their investment. This is what a bilateral investment treaty is, right? You know, if we suddenly decide to burn down their factory or nationalize it, they need to be reimbursed. So if that's not there, they'll never come. Okay? Is that true? No, it isn't. Um, World Bank study in 2003 um, looked at this and uh, said there was no real increase of foreign direct investment. FDI is what it's called, um, if a country had bilateral investment treaties, there was no correlation. And it's that someone like uh, Brazil, which I don't think has any, <coughs> they're turning away investors. So there isn't any proven correlation between getting foreigners to invest in your country and the necessity to have bilateral investment treaties. It is still trotted out. The Tories were, were saying this just a few uh, months ago. It's wrong. That study was in 2003, so I think even the Tories have had time to read it. Uh, since then, two uh, study was done by Tufts, which is a major American university, came to, it came to the conclusion that there are benefits from uh, investment, we'll, we'll give you some jobs, but was completely outweighed by all of the other costs. Um, and then there were two studies by Yale, one of the big Ivy Leagues, again, saying there's no proven benefit. So there is no proven benefit. There just isn't. It's not me saying it, it's the studies that were done. So, so why? I mean, I can see why the companies want it. I can see why the law companies want it. When Argentina, do you remember uh, early, the early noughties, Argentina ran into national trouble? There was a whole raft of articles um, put out by the law companies um, saying this is a perfect opportunity to take them to arbitration. Because of the crisis, they're now going to do all sort of, make all sorts of crisis measures, which we will then be able to take into arbitration, and they will lose, and we'll be able to strip money out of them. And they were sued 40 times. This is a country on its knees, trying its best to do the right thing for its people. And all the international law firms could say, those 20 companies, is this is a great time to get in there and strip them further. 40 times they were sued. Those same companies said the same thing about Libya and the whole Arab Spring, they said, these countries are now going to, in Libya, they said, um, because of the chaos, certain agreements that were made with you for your gas or oil exploration are now running into trouble. Get in there and sue, take it to arbitration. So, that's why they want to do it. And more than that, this gets back to the democracy. The problem with democracy from the point of view of business is, you can tinker with it. You can elect a government which says we'd like to change that. We don't think that's a good idea. Arbitration says we're going to lift this out from democratic control. And you don't even have to take someone to arbitration because every nation now knows that this can happen. It has a chilling effect on what countries think they might do. They've got to think ahead. If we thought, if we say we're going to nationalize um, the water companies because we think some of them are so badly run, <coughs> then a civil servant's going to tap the minister on the shoulder and say, sorry, minister, um, you do realize that that would be expropriation, and you do realize that we'd be taken to arbitration, and you do realize we'd lose. And the minister goes, oh, really? Oh, but never mind, it's a bunch. <laughs> so, so when Ed says, um, I'm going to cap gas prices, oh no, he won't. <laughs> a great many things which the parties promise you or say they're going to deliver, if you understand what bilateral investment treaties are about, 
you already know they're either misinformed or liars. And there's no second, there's no third alternative. It's one or the other because the law is there. You can go online and read the text yourself if you want to. And the precedents are there. I've got a list of arbitration where com com um, countries have lost. I mean, let me give you another one. This is one of my favorites, actually. Um, Doe Run versus Peru. Um, they, Doe Run, uh, which is part of the Renko Group, is a big company. Um, they took over um, a site um, for a lead smelt smelting plant in La Arroya, which is, there's a list of the world's most polluted sites, and I think it's number eight. The world's most polluted sites. Um, the company <laughs> completely failed to any of the cleanup that it had agreed to do when it made the purchase. It was a condition of making the purchase. They just failed to do it. And when the Peruvian government said, uh, you know, you said you were going to clean this up, that was, that was in the contract, right? You signed it, we signed it. And they said, oh, I know, but it's economic. It's very difficult at the moment. And, um, and then they went bankrupt. Now, they went bankrupt having reneged on a contract they'd signed, not done the cleanup they wanted to do. Peru in this had done nothing. And Doe Run took them to arbitration to the break of a million dollars. I don't know what the outcome was because you're not on. So if you think you're going to get fair and equitable treatment out of them, good luck with that. Um, what, the, what those agreements do is they set up double standards. If you wanted to take a company to court, you are required to exhaust, this is the, the, the boilerplate of the law of the land, you must exhaust all legal avenues open to you from the local level on up. So before you can get to the head, you've got to go through the local court, the regional court, the lower court, the superior court, the house of lords, you must go through all of that. Right? If a company wants to sue this nation, sidesteps all of that. It just steps outside. That's what arbitration says. It says, those are laws and courts for little people. But companies, you've got your own court. And what's more, as we just ran through, you own it. They're not handy. Not your own people staff it. There's no oversight. The organizations which run the things are all private, known by us. And uh, no one gets to even know what was said. And if they don't like it, no one has any right of appeal. Now that's pretty handy, isn't it? That's private law for the country. So there's a, a double standard. Um, and think about where we started, that they can sue you for loss of earnings. Now they're not suing you because you did something illegal. What you could do is entirely legal, like saying we're going to not give you a permit to frack. So you haven't broken a law. The nation hasn't broken a law, not even its own law. They can sue you simply because they say, yes, but having done that, you've expropriated our future earnings. But as a nation, we can't sue companies for a loss of our future earnings. Do you know how much the financial crisis cost this country? By the Bank of England's estimates, not my estimates, not some hairy lefty from the Midlands estimate, the Bank of England. They estimated the cost of the actions of those financial institutions has cost us 1.4 trillion pounds. Can we sue them? No. So they can sue us for loss of earnings that we've expropriated from them. But when they cost us 1.4 trillion in lost GDP, we can do nothing. So this is not a level playing field. And you can see why the companies love it. Democracy has no hold in this at all. You have no voting rights, you have no rights. At the beginning, back in 1959, from 1959 to 1986, when they were signing a few of these, they said, this is a solution to where you have weak government. And I gave you that example, you know, the revolution in Zaire. It's self-evidently not there to protect companies from weak government. 
It's there to protect government um, companies from strong government. When a country's political leaders listen to the people, they listen to the people of El Salvador and say, yeah, you're right, this is going to pollute from water quality. Or they listen to the people of Quebec saying, okay, you really don't want fracking. Okay. Or the Australians who tried to have um, change the packaging on cigarettes. Mm -hmm. Or Peru who said, you know, you just broke the law, mate. It's a protection against government, any kind of government, particularly democratic government. And there was a really interesting paper written by our old friend Jan Wilson, um, in which he, he writes, and remember, this is an international lawyer. International lawyers don't write frivolous things. They think about every word, that's their job. And he writes about Rex. Rex are, you know, Rex meaning king, the, um, the tyrant. But if you read carefully, about two-thirds of the way through, he slips up and he says, not to mention the tyranny of the majority, full stop, and then passes on. <laughs> okay, I think you'll find in that one little fragment of the sentence is what he's really writing about. And there's another quote, which I don't have at my fingertips, by two other arbitrators in one of their quarterly publications, um, where they say, not all adverse decisions come from tyranny, they can come from populism as well. Okay, populism is the word they use for democracy. Because democracy sounds kind of clean cut, doesn't it? It's almost like apple pie. Populism smacks of demagogues and chanting crowds. And people like you. Gathering suspiciously in a room without anybody knowing. <laughs> That's populism. So they're saying bad decisions can come from populism. In other words, people can say, we just don't want fracking. Thank you very much. That's a bad decision. Bad for who? Well, it's not bad for us. That's the idea of democracy. But they're making it very clear. What's emerging in their publications, in their mindset, which they have the power now to enforce on us, and we have no rights in it, is this notion that populist decisions are bad decisions. And how do you get away from it? How do you run, make an end game around populism, that dreadful thing that can happen? Well, you simply take the decisions out of democratic control and say this isn't a matter of diplomatic agreements or treaties or voting. You make it international law. And they're setting up international law as the thing which will supersede democracy. It means that the law is being used to remove the possibility <coughs> of change, to remove the possibility of democratic change to the circumstances that you will bequeath for your children. That is democracy, is it not? So basically they're saying we're just going to do away with this. And as I said, we signed 18 of these agreements already. So although it's an extraordinary claim to say that democracy is being rolled back, I hope I've given you just a taste. There's a wealth of detail which I wouldn't inflict on you. It is already happening. And if we don't do something about it, then Frankly, we will deserve what we get. And what we will get is what's already on the way, which is the complete rollback of democracy. And you'll end up with democracy being something that was a brief period. And you'll have something called technocracy. We already have technocratic governments, do we not? Didn't they have one imposed on in Italy? Can anyone tell me what a technocratic government is? No, I didn't think so. I don't know what it is. <laughs> It's not a democratic government. No one voted. Who imposed that government? Well, it was the IMF and the ECB, essentially. If the generals rolled into the center of Rome and said, we don't like this government, we're going to impose someone, and even if they called it a technocracy, we would know what this was. We would know that this is a butch. <coughs> Just because it's not being done with tanks, but it's being done with checkbooks, doesn't mean it's not a push.